everyone seems to get so hung up on Git commands. Like it's, they think it's really scary. It's actually not that scary. You only need kind of five, six commands that you use on a regular basis. And yes, there are some other commands that you occasionally need, but only worry about those when you need them and then you can search for them. So it's good to be aware of them, but really let's go through the ones that you need to use every day. So let's just get started. Let's dive straight in. So I've got a terminal behind me and I'm going to navigate to where I want the folder, the repo to be locally. So I'm going to go into downloads and then I'm going to go into repos. So I'm here. This is where I am and this is where I want it to be. You can put it wherever you like. And there's two things that you can do now to get started. You could do a git clone and then the repo URL. This is a URL from GitHub. You might have HTTP in front. I'm using the uh, SSH uh, protocol with Git, which is the best one. I highly recommend it. And Git has great documentation on how to set that up. But you can use HTTP as well, HTTPS. What this will do is take a copy of the repo in the cloud and put it locally. And it will create a folder and put everything into that. So let's do that to begin with, and I'll show you the other way. The other thing you can do is give it a specific folder name. So for example, the folder that gets created here will just be link free. But say I wanted to name it something else um, to be more specific to me, I could put another parameter at the end. It would be Eddie Jald, no, it would be Eddie Hub link free. I could put a hyphen in there if I wanted as well. There we go. So now I'm going to clone it. It's going to ask me for my password because I'm using SSH keys, but your setup may be different. I got my password wrong. And you can see now it's cloning the repo. I'm not going to set up the project or anything like that. I'm just going to focus on the Git side. So now if you're reading the documentation, it might say do an npm ci, npm install or something like that. And you'll notice it will fail because you're not in that directory yet. Remember to navigate into the directory that we created. And normally it would be the repo name, but in this case, I called it edihub hyphen link free. And now we're in here and you can see we're in the main branch. Let me clear my terminal and let's see the other commands that we can use. But before we get into that, I just want to say that if you're creating a repo locally for the first time, then you navigate into the folder. So you would create the folder, for example, in this case, edihub hyphen link free. I'm not going to create it because I'm already in there at the moment. So that's what you do. You would create the folder and then what you would do is a git in it and that would initialize the folder and we will get to where we are now. And in my case, because of the terminal I'm using, it would say git and it would say the main branch. So we'll be at the same place. There's two ways you can do it from an existing repo or from starting a new one from scratch. Most of the time, you're probably going to clone it. Let me clear that and let's go on to the next step. So the next thing you probably want to do, I always highly recommend it, is create a branch is the first thing you want to do. You don't really ever want to make changes to the default branch. If it's your repo or if it's a fork of another repo, that's something you really don't want to do. So what you can do is do git checkout minus B. So checkout is to switch branches. It does some other things as well, but let's just focus on this now. And minus B is to create the branch if it doesn't exist. And then we can just call it Eddie. Please give these good branch names. I've got many videos on how to name your branches and pull requests and commit messages, but this is just focusing on the commands at the moment. So if I hit enter, it's going to switch me directly into that new branch. So I'm here and Eddie branch is a copy of the main branch. Like, there's no difference. So the next thing you do want to do after you get the project running is actually make some changes. So I'm going to be really simple here and do some changes. I'm just going to delete a line, which I don't recommend you doing, but I'm just doing this just as an example to show you there's some changes. So you use whatever editor you want, VS Code, it doesn't matter. So the next thing I recommend you doing is doing a git status minus s, and this will show you the files that have changed. And make sure that only the files you want to change are changed. Like if it's some other generated files like the package lock, if you haven't specifically wanted to make changes to it, then you might want to undo that. And the way you can undo that is you can do a git checkout again and specify the file name. So in this case, if I do git checkout readme, before I do that, let me do a diff and show you the changes that I made in the readme. So yes, you saw me make those changes. But I want to show you the diff command. If I do it with no parameters at the end, it will just do a diff for the changes that I've made in my branch. And you can look, I deleted this line, it's in, it's in red. And so now if I put this back, git checkout, and then the file, it's going to put back the readme to what it was in this branch, not to any other branch, but into this branch. So if I do a git status minus s again, you can see nothing has changed. So if I do a diff, again, there's nothing, there are no changes. 
when you've got changes, the next thing you want to do and you're happy with the, the changes is you can do commits in two different ways. You can do them without uh, specifying the file path or the file names and stage the files. It doesn't matter. It's pretty much the same to just do what you prefer. But in this case, I'm going to show you the way I do it, which I think is the simplest way. And as part of my commit command, I'm going to add the files that I want to be committed. Yes, if I've done some extra changes and I want to do them in separate commits, I might use staging. But again, we can go into that in another video. Let me know in the comments below if that's something you'd like to learn more about. And I'm more than happy to go into details in there. And while you're down there, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. So let me, I haven't got any more changes, so let me try and make another change again. This goes to the readme. I'm not going to push this to the repository, so any changes doesn't really matter. Again, I can just delete this title and that line and save it. So if I do a status, you can see that file has changed. If I do a diff, you can see that I have deleted those two lines. And so you want to do a commit next. Let me just clear my terminal and get back to the top. So you want to do a git commit, minus m is the message. So you can say here, example changes. The other thing that you can do at the end of this is specify the files that you want changed. So here, I always recommend never putting a dot, never using git add dash dash all. Any of those crazy commands I think shouldn't exist within git. So Linus Torvald, if you're watching, any of the maintainers of git, please remove those commands. They're terrible and should at least be given a warning when people use them because it makes so much work for them, for the uh, author of the person making the changes and the maintainers because there's so much to clean up afterwards. It's better to get it right first time than to try and fix it later. So I would specify the file. So I would actually say readme. Maybe if I make this a bit smaller, you can see it all on one line. So hopefully you can see it all on one line now. Maybe making that long folder name wasn't such a great idea. <laughs> but hopefully you can still read this. So you can see I've got git commit minus m is the message, the commit message. Uh, you check the project and how they want their commit messages. It's really important. We use conventional commits in link free. So please don't write a message like this. And then the file. And you can specify more than one file. So if I had another file, I could then specify another file, for example. And you could just put a space and specify more files. Then you do a commit. It's going to ask you for a password because I signed my commits. Again, that's something I recommend, but you don't have to worry about that for now. It probably won't ask you for a password. And the next thing you want to do is push it. And if you're in a fork, it will push it to your copy of the fork. And if you're, if you're the owner of the repository, it will push it to the same place. So that's fine. So all you need to do is you do git push origin and then the branch. So in this case, Eddie, and that's it. I know what you're thinking, but how do my changes get into the main branch for everybody else to use? Well, they should come via a pull request. So therefore someone else can, can review it. If it's your own project, you might not want to use a pull request. Um, you might merge it, but I still recommend raising a pull request. Therefore, you can include other people who haven't started contributing to your project yet. They can kind of see what you're working on and some changes rather than looking at the individual commits. Pull requests make it a lot nicer. The other reason for doing it in a branch is if you're contributing to someone else's project, then they might squash multiple of your commits that happen in your branch into the default main branch. And if you make changes in your main branch, you're gonna get conflicts with yourself, which is kind of a bit weird. So actually that's a good point. Let's say I, I have made these changes and, I, and I've committed it and I've pushed it to the branch and I've raised a pull request, but I need to make some more changes because the maintainers have made some suggestions. Well, in the same branch, don't make a new branch, in the same branch, you can then make more changes. So if I go back to the readme, they might say, hey, we do want a title. So I could then insert a different title here and say link free. And I can save that. And I can do a commit again, like I did before. And when I push it, the pull request will automatically get updated, even if it's in my repository or in the original repository, because mine's a fork, it will get updated. GitHub works its magic there. So again, don't do a dot, specify the file and just say you know, what you did addressed PR comments. Again, come up with better commit messages than me. So now I've committed that. And you might be thinking, Eddie, that hasn't asked for a password. It's because it, it caches my password for about five minutes. So I don't get asked every time for my password. So now if we do a git log, which is another useful command, we can see that I made two commits by me today. But you might want to see what files were changed. Well, you could actually do a git what changed and it will show us the log actually show us the file that was changed each time. So you can see I, in my most recent commit, I'm, I changed the readme. And in, in my other commit before that, I also changed the, the readme too. And then you've got 
other people's below that. So get what changed. You can do that before you push so you can check that no other files have been included by mistake. Always worth checking. It's easier to fix now than it is to fix later. And if you ever want to see what the final changes are, yes, you can see them in the pull request, but maybe you haven't raised the pull request yet. You could do a diff. Now I showed you a diff with no parameters before, but you could also do a diff with the main branch. And so you can see what I've changed. And this is the collection of the final changes. So it's not showing me individual commits, which you can do a diff with. You can see exactly what's in the commits. But here I'm just seeing the changes between my branch called Eddy and the main branch. That's probably what you want to use more of the time than an individual actual commit diff. But it's there if you need it. You just pass it in the hash. So if I do a, a git log, I could get my previous hash. So not the latest commit, the one before, the first one I did. And I could do a git diff and I could see what I changed. So the changes from where I am now to the commit before I added this. So there's different things you can do, play around. There's also different commands you can use, like a log command. You can see now this is showing us actual branches. So you can see in the history what happened in what branch. So you can see these two commits two minutes ago and five minutes ago were in the Eddy branch by me. And then you can see further back six hours ago, there was a GitHub action. You can see that. And then also you could see Produma has done some improvements as well. And you can see the branches that they've been in as well, which is like super interesting. If your branch stays open for quite a while, so say this pull request is, hasn't been reviewed yet or it stays open for quite a while, one thing I recommend doing is keeping it up to date with the main branch. Therefore, you get less conflicts later. And there's different ways you can do this. But one way that I do is I do it manually on the command line. Some repositories have it enabled, like we do on Link Free, where you can click here and update branch. And that makes it a lot easier for people just to be updated in the UI. But I like to do it on the command line. So what you can do, and there are shortcut ways to do this, but I always do it in the long way. I just feel with the extra steps, there's less issues. So if I go back to the main branch, I would use the checkout command, but I don't need the minus B like we had before because we're not creating a new branch, it already exists. And then I can do a git log and you can see it doesn't contain my changes. The last changes were from what we saw a moment ago, which were from the action and then also Produma. So my changes aren't here. So what I recommend doing then is doing a pull of the main branch. And if you're in a fork, you're gonna to wanna to do it from the upstream, not from origin. So do a pull, it's gonna ask me for my password. Again, you probably won't get asked for your password and it says I'm already up to date. But if I wasn't up to date, then what I would do next is I would go back to my branch and I would do a merge or a rebase, depending on your preference, the main branch. So that's gonna pull in the main branch into my Eddy branch. So I'll do this and it says I'm already up to date, but if it wasn't, it would bring in those changes. We can dig deeper into rebase, we can dig deeper into remotes, into forks. Let me know in the comments below what you would like to learn more about and we can include those in a future video. So I feel this video is getting a bit long already and it's, these are the commands I really want you to practice with. These are something that you should be using every day. And there are other interesting commands like stash again. So it's similar to staging, but you can kind of stash it almost like kind of move them to the side, switch branches, make some changes, and there is patch as well. It's a whole load of commands. I don't want to show you every command that Git has. There are too many and most of them you won't use, but I want to show the ones that I use all the time, which are these ones. And there are ones that I use sometimes like stash and patch. And I want to show you those in the future as well. Don't forget in EddyHub, we have a Discord where we can help you with your open source and Git commands and anything else you need. Come and chat to us, link in the description below.